The following content is brought to you by Chilton Evangelical Church in Manchester, UK. Our location is M21 9FG. Our Sunday services are at 11 a.m. and 6:30 p.m. For more information, visit our website chiltonevangelical.org. We are indeed looking at the fourth commandment this evening. Um, I'll read it from the book of Deuteronomy and In a few minutes, I'll read it from the the book of Exodus as well. But let's remember, or let's remind ourselves that, generally speaking, the the commandments can be, not split, but uh, marked out as being mainly concentrated on God or mainly concentrated with our relationships to other people. And verses, uh, commandments, words one to four are focused on God and five to ten on people. God is at the centre of the first four commandments. They focus on him and his worship. They focus on his name. And the fourth commandment focuses on his day. Now let's remember that our Lord Jesus Christ, when speaking to some of the Pharisees, said that he was the Lord of the Sabbath. Shall not, is not the Son of Man the Lord even of the Sabbath? It is his day. It is the day that the Lord has made. It is the day that he has chosen. And in many ways, the fourth commandment is very much like the sixth and the seventh commandments. You shall not murder or you shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. Our Lord Jesus Christ expanded both of those commandments in the Sermon on the Mount. So those plain, simple words, you shall not kill, become a much, much greater commandment for us to obey. There's a lot more in the sixth and the seventh than the mere words that are written. And the same is true of the fourth commandment. It is not merely you should stop work, though that is important. It's a commandment that is a positive commandment. It's telling us that we should work. We should work for six days and then there should be one of rest. And that is then explained in the remainder of the the bit about the commandment. So I'll read from Deuteronomy in chapter 5, the uh, fourth commandment. It begins at verse 12 of chapter 5. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You, or your son, or your daughter, or your male servant, or your female servant, or your ox, or your donkey, or any of your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Very strongly, I hope you've noticed, there is that note of resting, ceasing from work. And that's the idea behind the word Sabbath. It's a ceasing from, a stopping, a cessation. This is something that that marks out the the Sabbath day or marked it out for the Jews, that they were to rest from their ordinary labours. In Exodus, chapter 20, verse 5, it's slightly different. We must remember that Deuteronomy, the book, is some sermons of Moses. So he's not necessarily reading what is written, but he's doing it from memory and there would be differences. So there are differences, but nothing of any major importance. Exodus 20 and verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. 
On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. There again in Exodus, as in Deuteronomy, there is that note of resting. And the idea of rest is very important. It came up in the reading from the book of Hebrews, that notion of there being a rest. It's there in Genesis 2. We read that at the start of our service. God rested on the seventh day. It's there in Exodus. It's there in Deuteronomy. In a sense, verse 14 talks about the, the, you, your servant, that everyone may rest. Now, God rested. But that doesn't mean he was tired out. He was not exhausted from creating the entire universe. So what did his resting involve? Well, it meant, as we saw, read at the, the end of chapter 1 of Genesis, he, he looked at everything he had made and he said it's very good. He contemplated, he studied, he considered what he had done. And he was satisfied. He could see, I have completed this. And he had that, that sense of satisfaction that there at the beginning, all is done and all is good. And so he could look at his creation and be glad at what he had made. And obviously there at the beginning, Adam and Eve had been created, and they had been told to work. They were to work in the Garden of Eden. But their first full day, because Adam and Eve were, were made on the sixth day, their first full day was the seventh day, the day of rest. And they were being introduced by God to look at the world and to look at themselves in that way, there is a day of rest, and it is a vital thing. Yes, we will work. Perhaps Adam and Eve, when they woke up that morning, thought, right, now let's get on with it. Let's do a bit of gardening. Let's tend that plant and this plant. But God said, no, you are not to work this day. This day is the day that we look at creation. This is the day when we consider what I have done. I've marked it out, it's holy, it's separate. Look at my works. And I'm sure that even after the fall, that they maintained that pattern, that they worked for six days and they rested for one. And they would have told their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren down almost to, to Noah, there is a pattern and we follow it. It's the pattern that God himself followed. Six and one. Six and one. And yet, oh, and, uh, we know from the fall, and we read through Gen Genesis, and we realize that man, in their wickedness, corrupted themselves, that their hearts were full of evil practices and desires, did they still maintain that pattern? I'm sure many did, most may not. But Noah, I'm sure, would have learned from his father, who could have learned it face to face from Adam, could have learned of the things that he had to do and the way his life had to be structured. We work and we rest. But that was not the goal. There in Genesis, we do see that the world was very good and man was very good. But the best rest is not there at the beginning with Adam and Eve in the garden. The best rest 
is still to come. And it's to come at the end, at the consummation of all things, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. That's the best rest. We've read from the book of Hebrews that in, in many ways, I know it's a close argument and there are many things that seem strange to us. But there in that passage in Hebrews chapters 3 and 4, God promised or God swore to those who rebelled against him that they would never enter into his rest. What was that rest? What was that rest? That rest to them was the land of Canaan, the land of promise, the land that God had said to Abraham and Isaac and to Jacob, your descendants will live here. That land of promise to them at this point was a land of rest, flow with milk and honey, a land that they could richly enjoy and be at peace. Israel was not there yet. Israel had not yet reached the border. Well, in Deuteronomy, they were there on the borders of the promised land, but they were still in the wilderness in a sense. Because they had not crossed the Jordan. They had not made it into the promised land. They had been redeemed from Egypt. They had been delivered from that tyranny, from that slavery, from Pharaoh. They were free from his clutches. But they hadn't yet reached their rest. And that's no different from you and me. Is your life full of rest? Do you ever have troubles? Do you ever have fights against temptation? Do you ever fall into sin? Do you ever do the things that you know are wrong? Do you find that, that your life is not a life of rest when you can just enjoy life, but you have trouble, you have toil, you have labour, you are not at rest? But if you are a Christian, you too have been redeemed. You've been delivered from the clutches of Satan. You've been delivered from the penalty of sin. You've been delivered out of the hands of that tyranny. And you've been brought into close fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been united to him. So why do you not have rest? Because you and I... We, like those Israelites, are, and it has been described as a wilderness people. We are still going through the wilderness. There's a very well-known hymn uh, in which you have the lines, When I tread the verge of Jordan, guide me, O thou great Jehovah. And it uses the crossing of the river Jordan as the entrance into heaven. Entrance into rest for the Israelites was crossing that physical Jordan. For us, it will be our dying that puts us into that other realm so that we'll, we'll, we will be at rest. Yes, we have a promise of future blessings. We have an experience of future blessings. They are here with us now. We experience them in Christ. We, we know what it's like to have our sins forgiven. We know what it's like to be able to talk with God. We know what it's like to, be, to have a communion with him. But we're still not at rest because of all our temptations and all the sins and all, all the fights against wickedness that we have. We, we struggle on to heaven against wind and storm and tide. It's a fight. Did you notice there in the reading in Hebrews, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, that promise is still open. That promise is still available. And that's saying we've not fully reached that rest. Later on in, in chapter 4 and, and verse 9, he says, So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. There is a rest to come. There's a better rest to come than the one we now enjoy. 
It's the best rest that is possible for us ever to enjoy. The Israelites were in the wilderness. They were in between redemption and rest. We too are in the wilderness of this world, between our redemption and our rest. The Apostle Peter described his readers in this way. He said, to those who are elect exiles, you're not in your home, you've been exiled from it. Beloved, I urge you, as sojourners and exiles, strangers, wanderers, still going through the wilderness. And the Sabbath, the Sabbath should be, we should think of it as pointing to that rest. It's a picture of that rest. It isn't that rest itself. It's a shadow of us. But it tells us it's a real rest it is one that is to come, one that is available, one that is guaranteed, one that we experience a bit of now. But what will it be like to be there? There are no words that we can currently use that will fully express what it will be like to be there to experience that rest that God has for his people. I've been talking about the Sabbath. I've been talking about rest and the Sabbath and reminded you that our Lord Jesus said that he was the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And unfortunately, many people think, well, if the Sabbath is made for me, then that means I can do what I want. If it was made for me, then surely I can behave in the way that I want. The prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 58, we read these words from God himself. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honourable, if you honour it, not going your own ways, or seeking your own pleasures, or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord. Isaiah was criticising the people of Israel in his day. They wanted to do on the Sabbath day what they wanted to do rather than what does God want me to do? <coughs> now, we often talk about Sunday as being the Lord's Day, rather than the Sabbath. Sometimes we do talk about it uh, in, in that way, but really we shouldn't. We should be always reminding ourselves that the Lord's Day is the first day of the week. It starts the week. And there's a very good reason for that. And it flows out of the passages that we've been looking at. In the Old Testament, with regard to the rest that the people of Israel had, they only had it in anticipation. They could only look forward to perhaps getting there. There were those people in the wilderness who never made it to Canaan. They had a hope, an anticipation. It was frustrated. It dissolved through their disobedience. They could only look forward to something at the end of the week. Something that was possibly going to come to them later. It was all in anticipation. But we celebrate the first day of the week. We have rest in Christ. He is, he is at rest. He has completed his work. We are in union with him, united to him, and therefore we have rest. We have tasted something of the glories that are to come. We have that present possession. It's not complete. It's not complete. It's only a future hope, but it's certain. It's guaranteed. Now, why is it guaranteed? Christ is risen. Christ is 
risen. He is the first fruits. He is the one who's gone first and foremost through, through death and come out the other side. And we in him have done that. And we in him, through him, will do that. Christ is risen. That is the guarantee of the fact that we have a rest that is going to come to us. The Sabbath was an anticipation. The Lord's day is a fulfilment. Salvation is secure, never to be lost. The Holy Spirit dwells within. The Lord's day is different from the Sabbath day. Because the Sabbath day was always looking forward in hope. We can look back. Every Lord's day. We should say to ourselves, perhaps when we get up in the morning, Christ is risen. Christ is alive now, today. That should affect all that we do. All that we think on this day. We don't come in, in some wishful thinking. We come in expectation. Christ has come. Christ has died. Christ has risen. And when we think of this day, the Lord's day, and we think of the fourth commandment, which is, which is a positive commandment, we must look at it realistically as best we can from the perspective of, of eternity. The Sabbath day is a day of rest. The Lord's day is a day of rest. What is eternity for the believer? That is the rest that we anticipate. That is the rest that is guaranteed. So every Lord's day, we should be thinking of it from that perspective of eternity. And perhaps think of the Lord's day as an outpost of eternity. A bit like heaven here and now. Why is it like that? What do we read in the book of, of Revelation? There around the throne there's an innumerable people. They've gathered together to praise God. And what have we done today? We've gathered together. Now, we're not a vast, uncountable multitude. But that's an indication. That's a picture of what is to come. Every time we gather, every time we meet one another to praise God on the Lord's day, we are saying, one day we'll gather around the throne in heaven. One day we'll be there with them. And we can look forward to remind ourselves, that's where we're going. Later on in, in the book of Hebrews, there. there in chapter 11, there's a long list of people who lived in faith. One of them, of course, is Abraham, the father of the faithful. And what do we read about him? Well, he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. He, along with others, they all died in faith, not having received the things promised, Old Testament times, remember. But having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, they agreed quite categorically, I don't belong. This is not my home. They desired a better country, a heavenly one. A city whose builder, whose foundations, designer and builder is God. Here we have no abiding city. We seek the city that is to come. That was their perspective. That is, should be our perspective every Lord's day. We're not at home in this world. We've gathered with the saints because that's a little foretaste of what it will be like to have that rest in all its fulfilment in heaven, in eternity, 
to come. Just to give you a little picture. Linda and I, we used to go off to Spain quite regularly. Her mother lived out there. And <clears throat> there still are these little groups of people, the expats as they're called, English people who go and live in Spain. And of course, living in a foreign country, what did they want to do? They wanted to make their little bit, wherever they lived, as much like England as it possibly could be. So they had bowling clubs and cricket clubs, which Spanish people just did not do. So, of course, it was only English people who were in the bowling club and English people in the cricket club. And, and you had supermarkets staffed by English-speaking Englishmen and women who got English food for the English people in Spain. And you think, why? I want to feel like I'm at home. Their home, they were living in Spain, but their real home was England. We're living in this world, but where is our home? What are we looking forward to? But in the meantime, before we get that rest, what should we be doing on the Lord's Day? Well, in, in Deuteronomy, it is a, the rest, the idea of ceasing from our labours, refreshing our bodies and our minds from the stress and strain of, of ordinary everyday work. It gives us time. So how will you fill the day? Is it going to be a 24-hour sleepover? Or are you going to do something else? Will you, will, you, will you do the jobs that you let, couldn't, didn't have time to do during the week? Will you concentrate on yourself? You get rest. You've got rest from all your labours. What will you do? In Egypt, the Israelites had no rest. Their taskmasters <coughs> just drove them on every day of the week to get their job done. You will have rest. Thankfully, most people in this country can rest, not have to go to work on the Lord's Day. Some do. Some believers have to. But the other thing that we can most certainly do as we observe the Sabbath day is that we should remember it. We should be remembering Remember that, as it says in Deuteronomy, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. The Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. You've been delivered. As a Christian, you've been forgiven. You've been cleansed. You've been made right with God. You've been justified. You've been... Remember those things. Remember what you were and remember... That day, if you can remember it, when the Lord changed you and all the days since then, how he's worked in you and blessed you and supported you and provided for you. Remember those things. Look back and remember what you once were and what God has done in bringing you out, in changing you. You've got time to meditate because you're not working all day long. You can think of your salvation, all its, all its facets and all their splendour, all their glory. Remember what God has done for you. Remember it on the Lord's day. But then again, we should remember, or rather we should not only remember the Lord's day, not only rest on the Lord's day, we should be refocusing ourselves, our lives. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul wrote this. If then you have been raised with Christ. In other words, if you are a Christian, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on the things of the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Set your minds on God. Realign your life. Think through the things that you do, the way you want to do things, how you do things, what your plans are for the future. Get them all aligned with 
the most important person in this universe, the Lord Jesus Christ. Get yourselves sorted out by refocusing on him, looking at him and seeing everything else in its true light. Can you imagine a woman on her wedding day waking up, being woken up by her mum and saying and being told, get up, you're getting married today. And then saying, oh, what, am I? It'd be incredible, wouldn't it? You would expect her, that bride-to-be, to have been contemplating for months previously about this day, making all the preparations for this day, making sure all the organisation was right for, to, for that day, the dress, the hair, the car, everything, month after month after month, focusing on that day. You can draw the analogy, I'm sure. Oh, we focus on that day. That day when we see Christ. When we meet him. Are we planning for it? Are we putting him first? We need to be refocusing to get our priorities right. That bride-to-be would put up with all sorts of things just to ensure that on that day, everything would be right. We should be refocusing, putting our priorities right. We gather to encourage one another, to sing hymns to one another, and to praise God. We gather to help one another. We gather in anticipation of that day of rest, that eternity, that endless day of rest that is to come. It's also a witness to the world, believe it or not. You come here twice on a Sunday, what are you saying to them? You're saying, the church, believers, God matters. When Linda and I first went out to Sydney to meet to her relatives out there, they wanted to plan things for us on Sundays. They only tried it once because they realised, no, Sunday is the Lord's day. We'll be going to church. It might be difficult, it might be time consuming, but we are going to church. It was a witness. They stopped arranging things on Sundays. No parties for us to go to, no big splash, great meals eating out. They're going to church. They won't be there. It's a witness to the world every time we come. Every time we say, no, there's a meeting, the Bible study is on. No, there's the morning service, there's the evening service. Perhaps one of the things you'll notice I've not said, you should not do this. You should not do that. You should not do this, that and the other on the Lord's Day. No. Look on what you can do. What is its purpose? Its purpose is to give us rest. It's a purpose to remember what God has done and to refocus our lives to what God is going to do. And the day when we meet our Lord Jesus Christ. Be forward looking on this day as well as backward looking to the day of resurrection. We should cherish all that the, the, the Lord's day offers us. I suppose the biggest challenge to each and every one of us. How much, how much of a highlight in our lives is the Lord's Day? Do we look on it with delight or do we put up with it? Do we think it is something that we will enjoy because of all the things we've been talking about? It's a foretaste of heaven, it's a picture of heaven, we're gathering with people who love the Lord as we do? Or do we think, I wish I didn't have to go? Those who aren't here because they don't want to be here rather than those who can't be here miss out an awful lot. They miss out meeting with God's people at the throne of grace 
And they miss out on another opportunity to look forward to that great and glorious day when we shall all stand before our maker and either enjoy his presence or hear him utter some awesome words telling us to depart. What's your view of the Lord's Day? Is it a day of delight, a day of gladness, or a day that you wished didn't exist? <laughs>